Okay, we're in uh, Matthew chapter 27. And I'm going to do some review here from verse uh, 33. Matthew 27 from verse 33. Jesus is going to the cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, which sometimes it's just kind of funny to me the way God not only invented laughter, God not only invented uh, the beauty of nature, God also invented cool. And so just like a Hollywood movie or something, Jesus is going to be crucified on a place called the skull. I mean, it didn't have to be like that. It just happened to be like that. The Greek for that is cranion, you know, where we get cranium from. And the Latin is calvaria, which we get Calvary from, right? And so that's why we say Jesus was crucified on Calvary. Uh, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, uh, so it was kind of an opiate of some sort. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink it. He was going to experience the full, uh, the full trauma of what it meant to die for his people, and he wasn't going to just be uh, whatever anesthetized. Uh, and when they had crucified him, which again means they, they took uh, his feet together, drove a, a nail through there, and then they uh, drove nails through his, through his hands. It could have been hands or wrists, but anyways, this, this region of him, and they no doubt tied him up there as well. Uh, it, when, it, when, when somebody's crucified, and crucifixion was a common Roman thing. There was a lot of people cru crucified, not just Jesus. I mean, thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people were crucified. Uh, when they were crucified, it was common. Some people died within the first day, but it's common for people to linger two, three days up there. Uh, in agony and the worst part is you're hanging on these nails in the way that people died from crucifixion was uh, asphyxiation they, they couldn't breathe anymore because you're hanging like this and so in order to breathe you had to push up on your feet and on your arms so you're up there with no food no water uh, suffering incredible agony and you're just waiting so you can't lift yourself up anymore and you die that way uh, and so the difficulty here is that Christ, uh, they didn't, the Jews didn't want him hanging up over uh, the holy days. So he's sitting up there on the cross. Uh, and so the, what the Nor Romans would normally do if they want somebody to die quickly on the cross, they'd take this big bar and they'd whack you on your legs so you snap your legs, just break them both, and then you could no longer push yourself up and you would die of lack of oxygen a lot faster. But the Old Testament said that Jesus wouldn't have any broken bones. So that was... That was kind of a factor going on there. But uh, we know that Jesus did not need to be uh, his, his bones broken because he died uh, on his schedule. Uh, he, went to the, he went to Jerusalem on his schedule during Passover. He, w his, he was paraded in front of thousands of people carrying the cross. Uh, when, when all the Jewish people were gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover ce celebration, uh, his trial went quickly, and he was hammered to a cross, and he died in an unbelievably rapid succession on his time frame, not on the time frame of the Jewish leadership, which did not want this to be done when there were so many people in town. Uh, they gave him a uh, gall to drink after tasting. He was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots, which is just a, an interesting aside. It's an ob uh, observation. But this was actually foretold in Psalm 22, 18. So hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ, it was foretold that his garments would be divided by a chance by draw. Sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up the charge against him. Uh, they didn't call him a burglar. They didn't call him a murderer or anything like that. They said, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews, which was the crime that the Romans were punishing him for because they were pushed by the Jewish leadership. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, uh, wagging their heads and saying, uh, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And we said last week, uh, people who are being abusive to, to God still do that today. They, they have their little test, their, their time. If God were God, then he would. If God were God, then he will. And, uh, of course, 
God may have a bigger agenda than, than we have. He may have different plans than we have. And right here, obviously, he came to die for the sins of the world, not put on a, a magic trick for a handful of people there. Uh, in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others, he can't save himself, which is interesting. Even his enemies were admitting he was doing good to others. And that, isn't that really striking? The people who were opposed with him accidentally let it out that they knew that he was saving other people. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and then we'll believe him. Uh, they wouldn't love him, but they would uh, be forced to acknowledge him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. So again, his enemies, uh, one, he saved other people. Two, he trusts in God. They acknowledge it. Let God rescue him now, if he delights in him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Uh, they knew who Jesus was claiming to be. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. And the neat thing is we learn from other scripture that one of the robbers, by the way Christ dies, by the way he's there, uh, changes his tune and uh, puts his faith in Christ. And even this last minute kind of... Uh, this last minute, minute faith before he dies, Christ looks at him and says, uh, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Uh, Jesus Christ accepted even that feeble faith right at the end of a, a condemned criminal's life. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. And from the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We said last week, these words show uh, the incredible the incredible uh, weight that our sin carries. Uh, when, when our sin was poured out on Christ, it, it broke the Trinity for the first time ever. Jesus Christ was not in fellowship with the Father and the Spirit. Uh, God turned away, the, the, the Holy Spirit left him, and at that moment, Jesus, who is always in fellowship with the Father and, and the Spirit, was isolated. He was alone uh, as our sin was poured out on him. And this, these words also, more than any verse in the Bible, God is saying, I love you. Jesus is saying, I love you, because Jesus was willing to endure this pain of separation, more than the pain of the cross, but this pain of separation, because he cares about us. Uh, and so he's saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sakatani. And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, they said, I think he's calling for Elijah. And again, these are not the kinds of things somebody writes hundreds of years later when they're making up a story. These are the way, this is the way it went down. Uh, there's no reason to put this in here other than that's what happened. As Jesus was hanging on the cross and he's calling out to God, some people said, you know, wait, wait, what did he say? Did he say Elijah? And immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled, filled it with sour wine and, wine and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. But the rest of them said, all right, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him or not. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from Top to bottom, the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. So when Christ rose, when Christ was resurrected, uh, this resurrection, his power spilled out across the land. Many, other, uh, many uh, other people were raised at that time. It says they were holy people. These were godly people. And uh, just as they were raised to life because Christ was alive again, we will be too. Put our faith in Jesus Christ. This is, this is a, a clear witness that those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, uh, we don't stay dead. We're, 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 uh, we're lifted up to new life. Now the centurion and those who were there keeping guard over him, uh, over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, truly this was the Son of God. And we said last week, this is the correct response when you see Jesus uh, to put your faith in him like this. Many women uh, were also looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, who were ministering to him. Among them was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So uh, you have people who come along uh, hundreds of years later, or in the case of some moderns, thousands of years later, and say, well, Jesus really didn't die on the cross. Where are you getting that from? 
But you have all these witnesses. You had his enemies who were there who wanted him dead. You had his friends there who wanted him alive. You had Romans who were used to killing people there to make sure he was dead. Everybody thought he was dead. And this is the only record we have from that time frame. Why in the world would you think that, he's, that he didn't really die and think of that later? That's, uh, that's just frivolous. That's just imaginative. That's just making stuff up. The, the record of the people who were there and who were witnesses, not only his friends but his enemies, uh, everybody thought he was dead because he was dead. People know what dead it means. Uh, Adam Clark Commentary notes that when he expired on the cross, the disciples, their expectation was cut off. They put all their faith in Jesus. They had traveled with Jesus. They thought he was going to kick the Romans out of the country and st establish God's kingdom. When he died on the cross, they became hopeless. When his body was laid in the grave, their hopes were buried with it. And nothing but the resurrection of Christ from the dead could have given a, res a resurrection to their hopes as well. Uh, there was a famous atheist who's now passed away. Uh, his name was Anthony Flew. He was a big deal at one time. And uh, during the end of his life, he uh, started to believe in a kind of a deism, a kind of belief that there must be a God out there. He said it's similar to the God of Einstein. We believe there is a, a, a mind behind the universe. There is a creative force there. Uh, but he was very careful to say, but this could not be the God of Christianity. There are people, uh, yeah, now atheists, who he was their champion, claim that he went crazy at the end of his life. That explains why he would open up the possibility of God. Christians note that there are clues and hints in his writing that he actually was open to the Christian God at the end. I don't know. For his sake, I hope he's in heaven. But one curious thing that he said was uh, he didn't believe in miracles. But if there was one miracle in the history of the world that were true, it would be the resurrection. Because he says there's so much evidence for that. There's no evidence for other miracles that he could see, but there's so much evidence for that. And if that were true, then obviously uh, Christianity is true. And no reason not to believe the, the rest of the miracles of Christianity. All right, let's read from Matthew 27, 57. Uh, Matthew 27, 57. That's actually the... Uh, the big, the big problem with Islam is, uh, I mean, the big theological difficulty for Islam is uh, they say Jesus didn't die on the cross. They said somebody who looked like Jesus died on the cross. Well, listen, there's a billion people or 700, 000, 700 million something people who believe uh, that Muhammad was God's prophet. They believe in the Quran today. If Jesus died on the cross which is what the records of that time tell us, his enemies, his friends, even, even the, the, the stuff that's not in the Bible, but the letters we have from the first 100 years, first 200 years, from friends and enemies, Romans, Greeks, everybody admits Jesus died on the cross. And if Jesus died on the cross, then Islam, that one thing means Islam is wrong because they said Jesus didn't die on the cross. God brought him up to heaven. God's going to bring him back down at the end of time, and he's going to wipe out the Christian church and everybody who believes that he was God who died for their sins. If Jesus Christ died on that cross, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. If Jesus didn't die on the cross, then you've got to figure somewhere else out to pay for your sin. I don't know how we're going to deal with our sin. Because an honest person knows they're messed up. A dishonest person can justify pretty much all their activity, right? all their thoughts. A dishonest person, a self-righteous person, can defend every one of their bad attitudes, every one of the things they've done. If you get just a little bit of truth into you, you'd realize, I'm messed up. I'm wicked. And what am I going to do with this? Who can save me? Where's my hope? And of course, there is no uh, hope if we have to find it within ourselves. I've got to be spiritual enough i've got to be religious enough i've got to do this or that we realize no there there's perfect god and then there's me and there's this huge gap between us if god didn't make a way if god didn't reach down there's no way i'm going to reach up to heaven amen amen so uh so it's a really a big deal that jesus christ died upon the cross and it says that he was born to die that he, he died in order to pay for our sins so from verse 57, then we'll continue on. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. 
uh, and who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, this is Governor Pilate, the Roman governor, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered it that it be given to him. Uh, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he cut out from the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting opposite the tomb. So now you have his friends come and get the body. The Romans uh, got the body. They took the body. They wrapped it. If he wasn't dead before, uh, he, he had about 70 pounds of spices on him to preserve the body so it wouldn't stink. 70 to 100 pounds wrapped tightly in cloth. He's dead now. Uh, it reminds me, when I, this crooked finger I have, I, I, I broke it playing uh, football with my friends at college, and it was popped out a joint in two places. And if it wasn't broke before we tried to pop it in, the loud snap when we were popping it back in, it was definitely broke then. And uh, went to the doctor, and he couldn't tell me when it was broken before or after. But uh, uh, if Jesus wasn't dead on the cross, he was certainly dead now. And again, even... Uh, his enemies had access to the body, his friends have the body, uh, and these women who are not with Joseph, because Joseph of Arimathea, he's part of the Jewish ruling council. This is a big deal. Uh, jo uh, Joseph of Arimathea and his friend Nicodemus were, were both followers of Jesus who were part of the Sanhedrin. Uh, and then Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they're watching this. Jesus Christ has died. The next day, uh, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, he, uh, this deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. Guys, did you notice what just happened there? These are the same guys who said, he said he's going to destroy the whole Jewish temple and rebuild it in three days, pretending like they couldn't know that he's talking about his body. Now that he's already dead, they say, wait, he was saying he was going to raise to life again. If you have to be deceptive to get your point across, maybe you've got bad points. If you have to lie in order to promote your religion, maybe you got the wrong religion. Uh, they, they, uh, they knew what they were doing. And again, they've been exposed by their own hypocrisy. One, they admitted that, uh, that, he, uh, they admitted that he helped others. They admitted that he did good. Uh, now they admitted that they really understood he was talking about his own body being destroyed and raised in three days. Their own, their own testimony is convicting themselves. And how often does that happen? Uh, when, when, our, when God doesn't have to judge us by his holy standards, he could judge us by our own standards, and we fall short of even the way we judge other people. We convict ourselves the more we talk. Uh, Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. And so Jesus Christ was telling his disciples, I'm going to raise again, I'm going to raise again. And uh, they heard it, but they really didn't believe it. But his enemies had seen enough miracles to think, well, we better, we better watch here something. We don't want this to happen. We don't want him to raise from the dead. We don't want his disciples to steal the body and said he was rose, rose from the dead. So they understood Jesus was talking about this. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Uh, go make the tomb as secure as you know how. As so they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So isn't this really cool? The enemies of Christ have just given us more re reason to believe in the resurrection. Because the enemies said, we better put a guard there. We better seal the tomb. And so as they're trying to defeat God's will, they're actually playing into God's will. The same thing with they didn't want to uh, crucify him during, during Passover, but they did. Uh, they, they're continually, the devil and, and the, the devil's tools were continually trying to destroy Christ's work. And continually they're just feeding into, uh, they're just serving God's purposes here. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, there were only 700, uh, sorry, 71, 71 uh, elders of the land, 71 rulers that uh, ruled in Jerusalem as part of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Now, there were smaller ruling councils of 21 that would meet in each of the villages and towns in the region, but this larger group of 71 that ruled in Jerusalem, they had religious power, they had the power to tax, they had 
a military power, uh, in Joseph of Arimathea to be one of these 71, it's like being a senator. He's an important man in the area. Elsewhere in Scripture, it tells us that Joseph was a righteous man uh, who looked forward to the coming kingdom of God. So he's living his life looking forward. When is God going to come and establish his kingdom? And that's why, because he was looking for God's uh, coming, that he was ready to receive Jesus. He looked around and thought, this has got to be it. Uh, and it also tells that he did not agree with the crucifixion of Christ. He, uh, he uh, tried to dissuade the council from doing that. But also, the Bible tells us he was afraid of what his fellow leaders would do to him. So he's kind of a mixed bag. And remember, this is written after the fact. This is written when all this comes down. And in, in the New Testament, shows us good about the disciples and good about Joseph of Arimathea. And it shows us bad things about him. This book was not written so that the, these original Christians could be glorified, made, made, got rich, and, and get, uh, get all the attention. It shows their weakness because the star here is Jesus. You notice why that's a big deal? Because if you're making up a religion, you make yourself look good. But if you're just reporting the facts, Joseph of Arimathea, yeah, he was a good man. He was afraid of what other people would think. And it's just right there in black and white because that was the reality of it. Here's a, here's a man on a process. He's on a journey learning not to be ashamed of his faith. Uh, he wasn't alone on the council, and I already mentioned. He had a, a friend, though, a rich young member of the Sanhedrin named Nicodemus. And uh, you could find about him. Let's turn to John chapter 3 real quick. John chapter 3. You can keep a finger there in Matthew 27. John chapter 3, 1 through 9. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. So he and Joseph of Arimathea both serve on this council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one else could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. How can anyone be born again when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Flesh, in, uh, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, said Nicodemus. So here Nicodemus is early on. He, why does he come at night? Because he's afraid of what people will think. But he says, we know. He's been talking to other people. This is probably Joseph, right? Joseph of Arimathea. We know you must be from God. But he's coming at night. Jesus says, you've got to be born again. He says, how can this be? This doesn't make any sense to me. Little, little farther, let's turn over to chapter 7 now. John chapter 7. From verse 45. Forty-five through fifty-two, and you see he's a little bit bolder now. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees. So the temple guards went to arrest Jesus, and the chief priests and the Pharisees asked them, "Why didn't you bring Jesus in?" No one ever spoke the way this man does. The guards replied, "Well, that was not going to be an answer that would make their masters very happy." They sent the soldiers to go get Jesus. They come back empty. Why didn't you bring Jesus? Because nobody talks the way this guy talks. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted, Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed him? No, we don't believe. But this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on those guys. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out where he is, what he has been doing? So they said, we don't, Those people don't know the law, but they're condemning Jesus already. And Nicodemus says, Hey, wait. Our law doesn't allow us to condemn him without hearing from him first. And they replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it. You'll find that a prophet doesn't come from Galilee. Uh, so that's, that's, he's just getting a little bit bolder there. And then now turn over to John 19. Two buddies. Two buddies. John 19 from verse 38. Two friends. Two secret followers 
of Jesus Christ. 38 to 42. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus after he's been crucified. Now Joseph was a, disciple, was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance to Jewish customs. And you, can you, that could not have been a pleasant job. They love Jesus. They love this good teacher. They love, they love him, and with, with, uh, with that love, they're going through and wrapping this body, taking care of his body. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb. We know elsewhere in Scripture, this was Joseph's tomb. He had hewn out for himself, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was uh, nearby, they laid Jesus there. Okay, back to Matthew, now 27. Look at the uh, place of honor that Scripture gives these two secret Christians. Should they have been secret Christians? No. Should they have been more bold? No. But we see them becoming bolder and bolder. And guess what? When they go to Pilate and say, we want the body, that's a public declaration that they stand with Jesus. And the rest of the Sanhedrin could not have been happy with what these two guys did. They went and showed love to the body. And the fact that their names were in Scripture, Scripture written before the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, says that they were willing to be public. They were willing to go public with their faith in Jesus Christ. And what's interesting here, they did what his own disciples were afraid to do. Where's Peter? Where's John? How come they're not wrapping his body in spices? But these two guys, you know, we always say Pharisees. These are Pharisees who learned to love Jesus. This guy who came at nighttime because he was afraid. Joseph, who was afraid to speak up, gradually becoming more and more public with their faith in Jesus Christ. Let's look now from Matthew 27, 62, to the end of the chapter. Uh, well, we already read that. I don't need to read it again. Let's just turn to the Old Testament then, Isaiah. So you don't need to put your finger in Matt. See, that's uh, I'm just testing to see if you'd be able to do that. Isaiah 52. How old is the United States? 1776 to, to 2014, how old is that? Two thirty-eight, two thirty something. All right. Uh, that's <coughs> almost. <laughs> what we're about to read was written about seven hundred, between seven hundred and seven hundred fifty years before Christ. What that means, several times the age of the United States. This is a long time. Seven hundred years is a long time. These were words were written about seven hundred years before Christ. Between the time they were written to Jesus Christ, nobody in the entire world looked like they could fulfill these verses. Well, there wasn't a lot of people. There was just a few millions of people on the planet at the time in, in China and in the Roman Empire, a few millions of people. Since that time, we've got several billion people. And I challenge you, find one person in the entire history of the world out of the, all the billions we have to choose from who look anything like a fulfillment of these verses we're going to read, starting in Isaiah 52, uh, verse 13. Well, there's, there's, <laughs> there's only one person that this looks like, and that's going to be Jesus Christ. <laughs> I challenged some, some friends online once to, to, I said, who do you think these verses look like? And uh, a Muslim friend said, well, it looks like Jesus, because these verses were written after his life. I said, no, sorry. 700 years before, and, uh, and a couple atheists agreed and said, well, it looks like Jesus, but that's because we've been enculturated. We've been, we've been conditioned to think this looks like Jesus. I said, well, maybe. Think about it a little more. 
Uh, but these were written 700 years before Christ in from 52, 13. See, my servant, this is Jesus, will act wisely. He will be raised up and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were, uh, just as there are, were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. Uh, this was how he was beaten on the way to the cross. So he will sprinkle many nations, and we know he sprinkles us with his blood, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. Uh, kings all over the world are affected because of this one particular person in history. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. So these are Gentile kings, Gentile kingdoms, who are going to know the truth because of Jesus. Who has believed our message, and from uh, whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot. This is talking about Jesus growing up as a baby, just a little, a little boy running around with his skinny arms and playing in the yard. He grew up like a tender shoot before him, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering, a man of sorrow, a man familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was laid on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. and The Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin, the guilt of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Is how he was silent before his accusers. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And a lamb had to be perfect and spotless, no, uh, no sin in Jesus. He also a lamb, you couldn't bring a crippled lamb or a lamb with a broken leg. And again, Jesus, none of his bones were broken. Uh, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who, can, uh, yet who of his generation protested? Where were those who defended Christ? For he was cut off from the land of the living. So he's cut off from the land of the living means he's dead, right? He's cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He died for our sins. This is in the Old Testament talking about what would happen in the future. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. He died with the wicked. Uh, and with the rich in his death, he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring. What? I thought he had no descendants. I thought he was cut off from the land of the living. Yet he will see his offspring and proclaim, prolong his days. I think Isaiah didn't know what he was talking about when he wrote this. I'm not joking. I'm thinking the prophet is being inspired by God. He's carried around by the Holy Spirit. He's writing this. And he's got to be thinking, you know, I just don't know how this works out. He's going to be dead. And now he's going to be alive and he's going to speak his offspring. His offspring are those who come to faith because of what he's done on the cross. Prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. Isn't that a beautiful picture of Christ waking up in the tomb? After he has suffered, he wakes up and mission accomplished. Because of what I've done, many people are going to become just, uh, made right before God. And he will bear their sins. He carried our sins. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. And we've talked about this from several different verses in Scripture. We are the spoils of what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he seized his spoils, which is you and I. He took them right out of Satan's hands, took us right out of Satan's hands. Because he poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered, Again, he died with the two criminals, numbered with the transgressions, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Uh, this is substitutionary atonement. This is him bringing atonement, bringing salvation, bringing rightness for us by being our substitute. It is not a New Testament idea. This is not an idea Paul thought up. This is right here, 700 years before Christ. Uh, and a lot of times the reason I mention this stuff is because those are weird ideas that just float out there. Is float out there, and they don't even make sense uh, if you look at things I in context. And here, this context is 700 years. Uh, 
Have you ever thought that maybe you want to be thankful for what Jesus did? I'm going to run this by you. Do you want to be thankful? Do you want to live a thankful life? Uh, what, it, what, what would it be to have gratitude in our hearts for what Christ endured for us, that he bought us eternal life, he bought us heaven, he bought us paradise by this suffering, by the pain he endured, by, the, by having all of our filth poured on him. He didn't have any sin, and all our sin was poured on him. Do you know that if we're always making an excuse for ourselves, always defending our behavior, always trying to justify ourselves, that's self-righteousness. A lot of times we say religious people are so self-righteous. There's two reasons why we say that. One is because religious people are self-righteous. They're just like everybody else. The second reason, though, is because we're self-righteous. and We want to point fingers at every, everybody else. Let's look at that word, self-righteous. What does it mean? It means I don't need anybody. I'm fine the way I am. I'm right with myself. I'm okay. Either you're going to be okay with yourself or you're going to fall at the foot of the cross and say, I'm not okay. I've blown it. I'm a sinner. Lord, forgive. I want to do things your way. Your ways are better than my way. And quit pointing fingers at other people saying they're self-righteous while you're really content with yourself, the definition of being self-righteous. Let's, let's bow before such a good God. He died for us. He endured this for us so that we could go to heaven, that we could have eternal life. I'm forgiven, not because Dan is so wonderful, far from it. I'm forgiven because Jesus is wonderful. And he said, Dan, I'll forgive you. Come to me. I said, I'll take that. I'm going to take that because I don't see any hope right here otherwise. So what I'm getting at here is when we're always defending ourselves, the Bible says times of refreshing come with repentance. Times of refreshing come with repentance. What does that mean? It means if you don't repent, if you're self-righteous, if you defend every single nasty thing, if you defend every attitude, you will have no refreshing. You have no peace. You have no joy. Thankful people, thankful people are not full of themselves. Thankful people say, wow, I'm just so grateful. Grateful people are happy people. Ungrateful people are always miserable. These are spiritual laws. Look at this. See that? I can't make that float up. That's gravity. It always is going to go down. There are spiritual laws. We're ungrateful. We're self-righteous. We will be miserable. Been there, done that. Okay? Been there, done that. We're ungrateful. We're self-righteous. We defend everything. We complain about everything. We think we deserve better. We're going to be upset. We're going to be miserable. Unthankful people aren't walking in obedience. They're not walking in joy. A couple questions. What do you deserve? Hell. I deserve hell. If I go to heaven the way I'm at, if Jesus isn't going to wash me with his blood, make me a better man, a new man, totally transform me, I would make, hell, I would make heaven hell for everybody there. I know how to do that. I know how to be difficult to be around. It comes natural. Being good, being like Christ, that takes a little more effort. What do I deserve? Answer that question in your heart. Because if your first reaction is better than this, you are saying, signing a paper said, I want to be miserable. And I want to walk in disobedience. And I want to be ungrateful for the cross. Because if you look at yourself and say, wow, I don't deserve any blessings. I deserve hell. Guess what? You're going to walk in the joy of the Lord. You're going to say, I don't deserve all the goodness God has put into my life. I don't deserve to be here at church today. I don't deserve Christian friends. I don't deserve to have the word of God. God of the universe gave me his heart. I can read this. I don't deserve to be able to pray to him. How, why should I be able to walk into the president's presence? Why should I be able to walk into some king's presence? I can't even walk into some Hollywood actor. All he does is act. I can't even walk into his presence. And I can walk into the presence of the king of kings, the master of the universe? I don't deserve this. So what do you deserve? And if you're always saying, I deserve better, I deserve better, I deserve better, that's, a, that's an unchristian mindset. 
what do I deserve? I deserve hell. And anything I get is bonus. And I've been getting way more than I deserve. I'm looking at Toriano. I don't, I'm really blessed, brother, <laughs> to see you here. We don't, Bob, <laughs> we're blessed just to be around here. And we, we don't want to go off uh, saying, ah, oh, I deserve better, you know, all this. Look around, we don't deserve this, and we've been given it. I'm not <coughs> chunky <laughs> because of a lack of food. By the way, my wife is so rude to me, she calls me Metabochang, which means Mr. Metabolic Syndrome. <laughs> I don't deserve that. <laughs> Maybe I do. <laughs> Jesus Christ said that uh, when Paul came to Jesus, he prayed again and again and again, take this thorn out of my life. Christ said, no, I'm sufficient for you. I want to ask you a question, brothers and sisters. Is Christ sufficient in your life? Or do you need Christ plus a lot of stuff? I've got a long list. I know what that's all about. Christ plus? Christ plus? Christ plus what? Popularity? Christ plus what? Different house? Christ plus what? No bills? Christ plus what? Jesus Christ said, I am sufficient. So the first question is, what do you deserve? And if you just say, I deserve hell, but I'm going to take you at your word. You say you'll forgive me. You said you'll give me a new life, and I'm going to take that. Second question is, is Christ sufficient in your life, or are you holding out for a different deal? You say, yeah, cross is nice, but. Yeah, Jesus loves me, but. I got to have this. I got to have that. I got to have this. Is Christ all we need, brothers and sisters? We just studied about his death last week, his burial this week. Well, look what he's done for us. And a little clue, if you haven't been around the church before, if you, have, if you don't know anything about Jesus, he's going to come alive again next week. Uh, just like we saw. We, that's why we read the Old Testament 700 years before he was born, talking about how he's going to be cut off from the land of living, and then he's going to see the light of life again and, and be satisfied. Jesus doesn't stay dead this has a direct bearing on the fact that you're here today. If he had stayed dead, odds are we wouldn't be here today. If he'd stayed dead, none of us would be looking to him for new life. So, brothers and sisters, are we thankful people? I'm upset with myself because uh, I'm just so good at pouting. I'm so good at feeling sorry for myself. Uh, what do I deserve? I, I don't deserve the blessings I have. I want to be thankful for them. Is Christ sufficient for me? Jesus, please. Uh, I want you to be everything for me. I don't need anything except Jesus. Well, that's not always true, but I want it to be true. It is true, technically, but that's not the way I always feel. You guys with me, right? Tracking with me? Jesus comes to us and says, I'm your sufficiency. I'm enough for you. It's like, you ever heard those love stories where they're poor, but they love each other and say, we don't need the car and the house and all this. We just need each other. And, and they do at that time, and then stuff creeps in. Well, Jesus is, is so much greater than that. Jesus is so much greater than that. And we have the love of God, despite the fact that we're so mean and nasty and self-righteous and self-centered and hard to be around. And he still says, come on. And you say, I don't know, maybe if you treat me right, I'll stick around. He says, okay, I'll treat you right. You know, what should he do at that point? You idiot. Don't you see what I did for you? We've got a good God who wants to be with us, and he is sufficient. Amen? He's sufficient. So what do we deserve? We, do, we don't deserve all the blessings we have. Is Christ sufficient? Well, he needs to be. And when we think about what Christ has done for us, we realize that he's all we need. We're going to walk in the peace and the joy of the Holy Spirit. And we can't find that peace and joy if we're rebellious, full of bitterness, uh, fighting with the Holy Spirit, and not thankful. One more time. One more time. Always goes down. Spiritual law. We're going to be thankful to Christ or not. 
Let's, let's, let's work on being thankful. And I need you guys to help me. Let's work together, being real thankful for God, thankful for our church, thankful for the brothers and sisters around us here today, thankful for this Bible. Thank you that we get to pray. Thankful that we get to sing. Thankful that we could wake up and, and we're not too sick that we couldn't come to church. Brother Norman, I had to walk him out to his car. He's dizzy today. I'm thankful that he came, and I'm going to be thankful when he starts to feel better. But let's, uh, let's, let's be really good at finding reasons to be thankful, and let's uh, stop wallowing in our, in our misery. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.